Tom McCone, the executive director. This is the ninth year that we've been doing Poem City. This is by far the largest project that the library takes on. It uh, takes an enormous amount of support from the community to make this happen. We get support from grants and in-kind uh, donations, other donations, lots and lots of volunteer work. And, uh, and that we need all those things so much, plus our presenters throughout the month uh, make this possible and the many people who participate. In particular, I'd like to thank uh, the organizations that provide uh, a large, larger level of uh, financial support for us. They include the Vermont College of Fine Arts, where we are today, Vermont Humanities Council, the Hunger Mountain Co-op, National Life Group Foundation, and the Poetry Society of Vermont. So thanks to all of those organizations. So another important event we have at the Kellogg Harvard Library each December is that we recognize a Vermont writer. And we've actually been doing this longer than we've been doing Poem City. Uh, the first year, we recognized um, Catherine Patterson, and Senator Patrick Leahy introduced her. This is, we had this gala event at the library, and we really transformed the building and moved the furniture out of normal places, and we get caterers, and we uh, bring in flowers and other decorations, have an open bar, and it's, uh, you know, it's just really a great evening. Last year, we made the, uh, real, had the realization that we had never recognized a poet. So I have a committee that works with me on selecting the honoree. And last year, we decided, OK, this year, we're only considering poets last year. This is, and uh, so we did that. And last year, we honored Ellen Bryant Voigt. And uh, Governor Madeline Kuhnert introduced her. And we really had a wonderful evening. And that's, it's actually a coincidence that those are the introducers of both political figures, because I think those are the, maybe the only two times that hap has happened. So then, after doing, having recognized the poet last year, this year, when we, were, we met to uh, talk about who to recognize, um, and it's so wonderful in Vermont because there's so many wonderful choices, but we figured, well, we did a poet last year, so now we're just going to open it all up again. It doesn't have to be a poet. Well, it turns out that we decided to recognize a poet again. So, um, and that poet is here with us today, one of our presenters. So would you please join me in congratulating Major Jackson. Major, would you stand? <laughs> so we'll be honoring uh, Major on the first Saturday of December. And, and we'll do a more thorough introduction a little later um, when, he is, uh, when he is speaking, when he's reading his poetry. So, first of our five poets. Megan Buchanan is the author of Clothesline Religion, published by Green Writers Press in 2017. Her work can be found in The Sun Magazine, Makeshift, A Woman's Thing, recent anthologies such as Dream Closet, Meditation on Childhood Space, and Roads Taken contemporary Vermont poetry, and numerous other publications. She is also a collaborative performer, dance maker, and high school English teacher who works with students with learning differences. Megan just received the 2018 Seedling Award for the Vermont, from the Vermont Performance Lab to restore her interdisciplinary performance project called Regenerations, Reckoning and Responding to the closure of Vermont Yankee. Would you please welcome Megan Buchanan. Hello. I love that there's like a room full of people to come out and hear poetry on a Saturday afternoon in sort of a terrible weather day. It's really inspiring. Sunday. Sunday. I'm on vacation this week, so I kind of lost track already. Um, so thank you so much for um, inviting me. And I'm really honored to read with some of my friends today and um, hear some posts that I don't know yet. Um, there's people here I know from the Vermont Studio Center, um, from meeting them in bookshops and becoming friends with them. So um, I just love the poetry community in Vermont. And um, 
So uh, also here is a woman who, last year I had some poems um, up for Poem City, and one of your um, local residents, uh, can I say your name? Liz Benjamin. She made a composition, uh, uh, three, three instruments and voice based on one of my poems. And uh, so there was this cross-pollination that happened without uh, me even knowing it, or, and I guess uh, they want us to do something with it next year. But anyway, I'm just really honored to, uh, that that happened and that I get to meet you today. And that's a Poem City, um, like a high five to Poem City. So this is my little book that um, I finally published last year, Clothesline Religion. Um, and I'm just going to read like maybe five poems and then we'll keep going. So thank you for being here. Um, I'm just going to, my poems are alphabetical in the book, so I'll just do that too. So uh, this one's called, I, I like to read this one always. Um, it's called, A New and Fervent Domesticity Has Seized Me. Okay. I can understand the boiling pots of strawberries for jam, these herbs in the window, gray and green, my daughter's knees like apples scrubbed with almond soap, stacks of white cotton diapers, and my reverence for clotheslines has been around for years, but what's with this ironing of tea towels in the dark at half past one? Scrubbing out the fridge, thumbnail detail, two weeks in a row. I can outsweep Cinderella, I'm suspicious of the dishwasher, and I have mastered all the dagger and caterpillar attachments of the vacuum. This is inexcusable, this pressing of creases in myself, new mother, this filling up of all my free moments with tidying, scrubbing, folding and refolding, as if untidiness was the reason he didn't want us, as if I wasn't clean. Okay, here's the poem that Liz made a composition of. It's a, a poem in the shape of the subject of the poem, called Buttermilk Moon. Buttermilk moon spilling into sky, up over folded mountain ridge, lush evergreen ridge spilling down to river, buttermilk moon rising full over valley, Light sliding, shimmer green water, shivering, dreamy, cool, buttermilk moonlight, golden river skin. Okay. This is a poem that sometimes poems are like part of a of a healing process for me, and this one's like that. It's called Mornings Full of Sunlight. One, when you are old, I want to be old and still here. I don't want to miss any of you, though I already do. Little bowls of breakfast, ramekins with a small bamboo spoon, jam jars of milk and your vitamins, brushing your hair to the side, golden light of July in each strand, it's wild. Two, all of this will end, mornings full of sunlight. I once walked to school with my two younger brothers. We balanced like a tricycle. We didn't tip until we got too big. We rode unpaved back roads, no headlamps, and we made it through somehow, how? Three, tonight, the mother part of me wishes I could go back to those three and say, God, I know, it's been so scary. Please come out from under the manzanita. Okay. Okay, I'm going to read an Ireland one because I heard the Irish poet couldn't make it last night. At the, what's the place called? Okay. So this one's from Ireland. It's called Singing at Matt Malloy's. And afterwards, when sober, red-faced uncles grabbed me for a dance, that freedom I've always been chasing was mine. And I hung on, eyes closed against the tourists, grinning as we flew and stomped, whirling round the center. 
The music roared in my head like the fierce hum of sea inside a shell, salty and unending, and for long moments I was entirely possessed by that ordinary magic. Okay, one more little one. This one is called Pocket, and I think this was part of Poem City last year. Pocket. And I'm here again, hanging out in the pocket of God's favorite shirt. In worn blue flannel, filtered light and sound, I'm suspended along for the ride. Tag along, tiny human, I'm held and warm, horizontal against heartbeat. I can't see the sky. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Diana Whitney writes across the genres in Southern Vermont. Her first book, Wanting It, became an indie bestseller and won the Rubery Book Award in Poetry. She is the poetry columnist for the San Francisco Chronicle, and her essays, poems, and book reviews have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Kenyon Review, Glamour, and many more. Diana is the winner of the 2015 Women's National Book Association Poetry Prize, selected by Ellen Bass, and has received grants from the Sustainable Arts Foundation, the Vermont Arts Endowment Fund, and the Vermont Studio Center. Maybe she'll tell us how she came to be the poetry columnist for the San Francisco Chronicle. But anyway, would you please welcome Diana Whitney. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. I think my alter ego lives in San Francisco, but I live in Brattleboro. <laughs> um, and I'm so happy to be back up here in Poem City. I think this is maybe my third year in a row, um, and I love it. I love all the poems all over the windows, windows into windows. Um, so I'm going to read, I think, from winter into summer. and. Uh, I'm going to start with a poem that takes place on the meadows in Brattleboro. I don't, if you're from down there, you know what it is. It's uh, a part, a confluence of the West and Connecticut rivers that freezes over, and it's kind of like Brattleboro's um, seasonal cocktail party when it, when it freezes, everybody comes out of the woodwork. And, um, and this is about a, a scary accident that happen and the blessing that it is to um, come out the other side. Mirage. Cataract light glowered above the meadows. Long season of mistrust, winter's bone gnawed and tussled by my bad mood, every last scrap of gristle worried from the edges. Still, we sat down on milk crates and laced up our skates, an act of hope on a frozen channel in a small town in a dark time. Cold sunlight glared in the rushes. Ice can be harder than any surface, harder than asphalt, harder than bone. I asked if she wanted her helmet, black vinyl shell, face cage like a gladiator's. No, she said hatless and zoomed free into the day, a speck of blue fleece and flying gold hair. The Sunday crowd stepped out with wool coats and silver flasks. The fishermen slid live bait onto hooks, set the long lines, and waited. I skated to the confluence and back, humming, I wish I had a river, scanning the surface for splits and fissures. The crack of her skull hitting ice reverberated down my limbs, adrenaline shot straight to the brainstem, her scream like a bayonet lancing the sternum, a demon prying ribs open to get to the heart. What is inside us is wet and humble and slippery as fish. She lay still on the ice turning blue in the long minutes before sled rescue five EMTs baby-stepping towards our numb huddle. 
a whole lifetime unfolded as they hoisted her on the sled, slid it across the ice to the ambulance, warm and dry as a mirage. Sitting in the jump seat with her hooked to the monitors, I began to pray. Later in the ER, wrapped in heated blankets, she ate a red popsicle and wept when the nurse said, no screen time. Ice can be harder than any surface, harder than pixels, harder than bone. We were the lucky ones going home with our girl, small egg lump on the back of her head. How I studied the sheets of concussion commands. An ocean away, a rain of bombs cooled the desert. Quiet welded the night with stars, constellations of shattered families. Fear sloshed in a metal bucket. So um, moving on to mud season. Uh, this poem is short, it's a sonnet. And I am very grateful it just appeared in the latest uh, issue of Green Mountains Review, which is a wonderful journal right here in Vermont. It's called Sugar Maker. The heat lamp in the hen house burned all night, all day. The birds scratched hopefully at snowpack as you tap, tap, tapped the cold bark looking for a vein. Drill and hammer, freeze and thaw, lion and lamb blown raw by the winds of marriage, slush ravaged hens huddled in plywood and sawdust. I crushed the secret like pitch pine tips carried my fragrant hands close to my chest, waited for mud season's slow revelations, mist and murk rising from the remains of winter, first drops plunking buckets, a reminder. Sap run in muck boots, steady as rock maple you come with your pails slopping over, sugar maker at the steaming arch, tending our dark amber. My husband makes maple syrup in our backyard. <laughs> so I'm going to read one poem um, from my book, Wanting It, and goes all the way back to kindergarten. It's called A Marriage Story. Kindergarten was wood chips and Julio on my tail like a rocket through the playground, black eyes and fast legs crawling in the tire tunnel breath on my turtleneck scrabbling the rope wall, bouncing me off the hanging walkway into the monkey bar house. Every recess he said he would marry me. He said it like a threat, like I'm going to kill you, and I knew if I ran too slow and he caught me, it was true. At home, my mother brushed my brown hair like a precious fleece, static crackling beneath satin ribbon, as I cried for my future, for my new life with Julio. Even after the promises and parent-teacher conference, after recess inside and timeouts for Julio, I cried like the world was ending, which it was, because Julio proclaimed I would grow up and leave home, small prophet in corduroys staking his claim where boys stashed mosses and secret bones, played out their terrible shouting games. I was fast, but I couldn't outrun them. In another forest, the girl glimpsed the gold, trick apple of love concealed in underbrush, and she slowed her sprint to gather it up. The last warrior who raced her caught her like this, reeled her in like a fish on a line. At night in the king bed, my yellow ring shines, bites my sleeping finger sometimes without warning. I'm going to do two more, two summer poems, just to reassure us today that it's coming. <laughs> so July and August. The first one's called Torched, and it has a little epigraph from uh, Olina Kalitiak Davis. Too much was never enough. Torched. All the gl g oh, sorry, I'm going to start again. All the garish flowers opened in midsummer. Tiger lilies yawning on the road. 
Bordello blooms climbed over each other, bee balm, plume poppy, bronzy red and gold. I dragged the couch onto the summer porch in another incarnation of desire. You were the one who lit the torch with pollen, diesel, and meadow fire, cooled it with blackberries dripping juice, water pulled from a boreal spring. The cat unfurled herself on the car roof like a black velvet ribbon of longing. The hay lay knit and spun in torrid rows, falling in a blonde mess to the shoulders of the field. You coasted slow as syrup down the edge of my daydream, engine purring, windows down, rust truck of trouble come back around. And the last one uh, takes place in the upper valley. Uh, right along the Connecticut River. Velvet Rocks. August in a cotton smock, I hoofed up velvet rocks, 40 weeks to the day, full up to my sternum with baby. The elastic band of my bike shorts rode low beneath my belly, panting like a wolfhound, cranky and hot. All I wanted was to get you out of me. So I tramped the granite switchback, path lined with mosses, arms swinging the humid summer forest of my impatience, my trial by fire. As the sun rose higher above the valley, the river snaking between two states. How matter shifts, firm to yielding, solid to liquid, liquid to air. I'd done all my homework, read all the books, practiced my breathing, my hypno-visualization, swallowed evening primrose oil each morning, slid the golden capsules deep inside where they melted like honey to soften the cervix, and you dropped into the pelvic bowl, sunny side up, ready or not, here we come. They said, keep walking, so I hauled you up velvet rocks to the shelter where I'd camped at 19, eaten watermelon by firelight, a stone's throw from the tiled hospital, the mechanical bed beaded with sweat, ice cubes melting on my forehead as if on a skillet, your skull bearing down, your neck arched back. You were navigating the tunnel. We were digging deeper, the summer river green and flecked with amber, suspended between two states of matter between out and in, between here and there, S-curves of current shifting, alluvial silt filtered through algae, bright scalpel, your blood, my blood, white curtain drawn tight, bright room like a boat where they hauled you in thrashing. Thank you. So uh, four of our five poets don't live anywhere close to Montpelier. So, uh, Diana and I started emailing yesterday about the weather forecast. And then this morning, it was, uh, it was wonderful to hear from her. She had checked in with all of the poets. And all five were going to make it. So I don't know if you caught that or not, but Megan and Diana drove up from Brattleboro. So a couple of hours, and that's, that's really great. And our, our next two poets, Major Jackson and Dee Dee Jackson, came down from Burlington. So, uh, so next one is Major Jackson. Major is an American poet, professor, and author of three collections of poetry. Holding Company and Hoops were both finalists for an NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Literature Poetry. His first volume, Leaving Saturn, won the 2001 Cave Canham Poetry Prize and was a finalist for a National Book Critics Award. Major is also a recipient of the Whiting Writers Award and has been honored by the Pew uh, Fellowship in the Arts and the Witter Bannon Binner, Binner, uh, Foundation in conjunction with the Library of Congress. Would you please welcome Major Jackson. Good 
Good afternoon. Um, really good to read with such fine poets. Um, uh, and also to read back here in Montpelier. Thank you, uh, Diana, Karen, Megan, Dee Dee, uh, for uh, gracing us with your brilliance. Um, I am, I, Dee Dee and I just finished a workshop with some Girl Scouts. Cool. <laughs> Poetry, they wanted to, and we, we had a cool time. We did, um, we did a, an exquisite corpse and we did uh, Joe Brainerd's I Remember poem. And um, the conversation came up about rhyme, whether or not poetry could be rhyme. And I made up some tale about in 1900, two groups fought over whether or not poetry could exist without rhyme. And a little girl named Madeline cast the last vote. They all read Madeline. This is a poem that rhymes, because um, and I've been writing just far too many serious poems, so I just thought I would have a little fun. This is called History. If you could turn back the clock, where would you stop? Would you hear freedom ring from the voice of a king? Would you sing along with Paul and John? on a song? Or would you dine with Antoinette and risk your neck? Or far from Hiroshima, raise a flag in Iwo Jima? Would you stand bewitched as Edison threw a switch? Would you look with delight as Orville scaled the heights? Maybe you'd shrug and simply turn the dial to a place called now. If you could turn back the clock, where would you stop? Would you cry aloud for the fall of the Berlin Wall or visit the globe to see King Lear by the new playwright, Billy Shakespeare? Would you be among the crowds as Paul Robeson took a bow or Nina Simone or Frank Sinatra or maybe Costa Diva Maria Callas? Would you salute the opera chick as it launched Sputnik, which led between the Soviets and us a nuclear hotline in case of a crisis. Would you dance with Martha Graham or Merce Cunningham or Alvin Ailey or Fred Astaire or tap with Bojangles on a stair? Maybe you'd shrug and simply turn the dial to a place called now. If you could turn back the clock, where would you stop? Would you cross the Delaware, block a tank at Tiananmen Square, fight the Battle of Concord, ride shotgun with Henry Ford, run the bases with Ty Cobb, celebrate Valentine's with the mob? Would you boogie woogie and sing the blues on a Harlem step with Langston Hughes? Would you fight for a woman's right to vote in Seneca Falls? Would you kill just for the thrill like Charles and his Neanderthals? Would you circle a tree with a rope? Travel to Rome to cheer the Pope? Fight tea taxation, escape a plantation, sign a declaration, or build a nation. Maybe you shrug and simply turn the dial to a place called now. If you could turn back the clock, where would you stop? That is an ongoing poem. I keep saying I'm going to add some stanzas just before a new reading. I didn't do it this time, but. Why not? Here's another um, newish poem, recently published. You can find it online. It's uh, an elegy um, to the poet Derek Walcott, um, who passed away a year ago this month. And it's uh, written in three sections. 
Island traffic slows to a halt as screeching gulls reluctant to lift heavenward congregate like mourners in salt-crusted kelp as the repellent news spreads to colder shores. Sir Derek is no more. Bandwidths clogged by streaming tributes carry the pitch of his voice, less so his lines, moored as they are to a fisherman's who strains in the Atlantic, then hearing too, drops his rod, the rill unspooling like memory till his gate mouth matches the same look in his witcher, wicker grill. That frozen shock, eyes marbling a different catch. Pomerac trees, sea grapes, and laurels sway, wrecked having lost one who heard their leaves, rustic dialect as law, grasps their boughs as edicts from the first garden that sowed faith and believe he did. Astonished at the bounty of light, like Adam over Castries, Casambas, port of Spain, the solace of drifting clouds, rains like hymns, then Edens of grass, ornate winds on high verandas carrying spirits who survived that vile sea crossing, who floated up in his stanzas, the same souls a shield saw alive the ocean their coffin. Faith too, in sunsets, horizons whose auric silhouettes divide and spawn reflection, which was his pen's work. Devotion twinned with delight, divining like a church sexton. Poetry is empty without discipline, without piety. He cautions somewhere, even his lesser rhymes amount to more than wrought praise, but amplify his poems as high prayer so as to earn their wings above, pelicans move into tactical formation, then fly low like jet fighters in honor of him, nature's mouth, their aerial salute and goodbye. Derek, each journey we make, whether Homeric or not, follows the literal wake of some other craft's launch, meaning to sense the slightest motions and unmoving Waters is half the apprentice's training before he oars out, careful to coast, breaking English's calm surface. What you admired in Eakins, in conversation at some cafe, New Orleans, Philly, was how his rower seemed to listen to ripples on the school kill as much as to his breath, both silent on his speaking canvas. Gratitude made you intolerant of the rudeness of the avant-garde or any pronouncements of the new for breathing is legacy and one's rhythm though the blood's authentic transcription hymns us to ancestors like a pulse this i fathom is what you meant when exalting the merits of a fellow poet that man is at the center of language at the center of the song Yet a reader belongs to another age and likely to list our wrongs more than the strict triumphs of our verse often retreats like a vanished surf spoon frothing on a barren beach. The allure of an artist's works these days is measured by his ethics. Thus, our book scrub clean rarely mention the shadowless dark that settles like an empire over a page. Your nib like the eye of the moon flashed into sight the source of Adam's barbaric cry. Departed from paradise, each nobody a sacrifice, debating whose lives matter, whereon a golden platter our eyes royal, dilated by hate from Ferguson to Kuwait. You, Maitre, gave in laughter, but also for the hereafter an almost unbearable truth we are the terrible history of warring births destined for darkest earth. So as cables of optic lights bounce under oceans, our white pain codified as they are and fiber layered in Kevlar, we hear ourselves in you. Where race exiles us to stand lost as single nations awaiting your revelations. A shirtless boy Brown as bark gallops along shore, 
bare back and free on a horse until he fades, a shimmering all that remains. <clears throat> My last poem is called uh, Mr. Pate's Barbershop. And it is um, in memory, another kind of elegy, I guess, in memory of a, of a barber who cut my hair when I was a kid. Um, someone who we made up a rumor about that he didn't throw hair away after he cut little boys' hairs and um, put it in jars in the back of his shop. Mr. Pate's Barbershop. I remember the room in which he held the blade to my neck and scraped the dark hairs foresting a jawline, stacks of ebonies and jets, clippings of black foxers, Joe Fraser, Jimmy Young, Jack Johnson. The color television bolted to a ceiling like the one I watched all night in a waiting room at St. Joseph's while my cousin recovered from gunshots. I remember the old Coke machine, a water fountain by the door, how I drank the summer of 88 over and over from her paper cone cup and still cannot quench my thirst. For this was the year of, this was the year funeral homes boomed, the year Mr. Pate swept his own shop for he had lost his best little helper to gunfire. He suffered like most barbers suffered quietly his clippers humming so loud, he forgot Ali's lightning left jab, his love for angles, for carpentry, for baseball. He forgot everything and would never be the same. I remember the way the blade gleamed fierce in the fading light of dusk and a reflection of myself panned inside the razor's edge, wondering if I could lay down my pen, close up my ledgers and my journals, if I could undo my tie and take up barbering where months on end a child's head would darken at my feet and bring with it the uncertainty of tomorrow. Or like Mr. Pate, gathering clumps of fallen hair at the end of a day in short, delicate whisks, as though they were the fine findings of gold dust he deposit in a jar and place on a shelf only to return Saturdays, collecting as an antique dealer collects, growing tired but never forgetting Someone has to cherish these tiny little heads. Thank you. Thank you, Major. Dee Dee Jackson's poems have appeared in The New Yorker, Plowshares, The Common, Watershare, uh, wa excuse me, Waterstone Review, among other publications. Her manuscript, Almost Animal, now Killing Jar, was a finalist for the Alice James Book Award, the Lexi Rodnitsky First Book Prize, and the Autumn House Press First Book Award. Dee Dee's first collection of poems, Killing Jar, is forthcoming from Red Hen Press. Her chapbook, Slag and Fortune, was published by Floating Wolf Quarterly. Currently, Dee Dee teaches poetry and the visual arts, 20th century poetry of war and witness, and creative writing at the University of Vermont, and serves as the poetry editor for Green Mountains Review. Would you please welcome Dee Dee Jackson. Thank you all for, um, thank you for the introduction and wonderful to read with some very good friends and amazing poets. Um, and I'm going to jump right in. This poem is a poem that I just wrote last week. So I'm going to be brave and read it today. It's titled, Listen. Like a hundred gray ears, the river stones are layered in a pile near the shed where morning doves slow their peck and bobble to listen to a chorus of listening. Small buds on the lilac perk up. A cardinal's torpedoed call 
comes in slow waves of four, round after round. It's a love call, a call to make him known to himself. The stones listen harder, decipher the song, attempt to offer it back its echo, but fail. This is not a poem of spring. This is a poem well aware that gray flesh is dead flesh. All of the ripe listening comes at a cost. The first sky is in all skies. The first song in all songs. On Hawk Mountain, Vermont. I should say this, I just moved up from Florida two years ago and I always feel like I should, I love to write about Vermont now. It's, an, it's, it's a new world for me. Everything about the snow, <laughs> winter lasting well into April, um, <laughs> birds and such, I'm just, I'm fascinated. So, um, so and the, you'll see that's a theme in my work. Okay, <laughs> anyway. So on Hawk Mountain, Vermont. I'm parting with the sun that like a Greek oracle descends the temple of mountains before me. Their silhouette darkens to Oxford blue, elides the current of the sky until I no longer see crest or peak. After moving up from the south, how much should I know of coniferous trees or of chickadees who play their winter song of Phoebe, Phoebe, the last note toppling an octave from the first like a softly closing door. The northern sky stands so straight, it uses the largest pines for crutches. They bend under its weight. We have a friend who isn't happy I'm white. With him, though, the road is just sampling the sound of rain. So my husband and I hold hands as often as we can each finger erupting a new continent. But in the early evening, I worry that if pulled over when my husband lifts his empty hands, he is lifting only his blackness. At this hour, a chickadee cries in staccato, D, 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 D. I wonder how it knows my name before I look at our marriage in the milky evening light. Um, my next poem is written, it's dedicated to a student of mine who um, was murdered, it's a murder-suicide, um, uh, domestic and gun violence. So it's uh, titled The Burning Bush, and it's dedicated to Brianne Ort. An entire alphabet can be stuttered in a few gunshots. So often it's the boyfriend spiraling down the chamber, his words lodged in the barrel behind the bullet fast and frenzied. We all wonder why the trash at the dump never stops burning, why the blind look to the wind. The rain stumbles outside the window, the tombe before the heavy pot of array of rain. Cathedral de San Marco in Venice speaks two languages, Greek and Latin. And I am jealous of those with two tongues, like the white pine whose trunk cracks and whose needles whistle to the bilingual nuthatch. The sun tortures the tips of the trees on a descent from a world where no woman is safe. Even the man who loved her wanted her dead. The burning bush is an invasive species, yet cardinals and chickadees flock to its red seeds and flame leaves in the fall. I should cut it to a stump and rot its roots, but instead I admire its show of color, watching the damage as it spreads. My next poem I wrote um, exactly almost a year ago because my son just turned 20, and the title is Directions from My Son, on his 19th birthday. I cup my hands to hold your youth. I try to show you how to do the same. It takes decades of practice to get this right, 
and by then it's always too late. Yesterday, a man stabbed a homeless man on Church Street. At dinner, we tucked this story between bites of salmon, pieces of song by Fleetwood Mac melting from the speaker. It rained all day today. I told you that I always thought I'd have another baby. In truth, I knew I was only good for one. No matter how hard you press the outer edges of your palms and pinkies together, they will always leak. You should know that you can't hold water in your palms for long. Don't put yourself in a spot where you'll have to carry all you'll need. At dusk, we count four rabbits on the back lawn, and I consider if it is a sign only to watch the stocking feral tabby turn them to humble bronze, heavy and frozen and hopefully downwind. At least once a year, you should close your cupped hands like a book. Not to worry, hinged, they always open again. I decided at the last minute to read a, an Ireland poem too. <laughs> you inspired me to do that, so I thought I'd add my, my Ireland poem in there. And then I'll read one more after that. So. You should have read your Ireland poem. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a little Vermonty too because um, it's titled Four Days Before Winter Solstice. How will I ever memorize the pattern of snow or the scripted footfalls of rabbit and squirrel around the yard, its blank white cheek turned from the early falling light? I wish I could tend to the light like I tend to a fire, stoke it so it might linger just above the pines. The solstice has not yet come, and we still spin into darker days. The familiar noise of the nightly news echoes inside the cave of our darkened home. At Newgrange in the Boyne Valley of Ireland, light runs the passage of the megalithic tomb precisely on the winter solstice flooding the chamber. When there this summer, we use flashlights for the same effect. But in those sumptuous green days, we couldn't remember how much we would need the turn from the longest hours of dark. At the entrance of the tomb, triple spirals map the curbstone like carved melody, swirls like Neolithic voice, a mantra to memorize before entrance into the sacred. I can recite John 3.16, I can name the order of the planets, and get most of the words to Stairway to Heaven. When I glance out the window, I can tell a chickadee from a junco, titmouse from a waxwing, even the red and white pine can be parsed. A poet I admire said that birds are made mostly of air. In the dim light, they whirl around the seed for our last feeding and add to the mysterious coils and ruins in the stacked snow. All right, so um, I'm going to end with signs for the living. Sometimes... After the last, well, I should change this first line to the last snow in April because maybe that'll bring us good luck. But anyway, sorry, <laughs> I was just thinking that. Signs for the living. Sometimes, after the last snow in May, after the red winged blackbird clutches the spine of the cattail, after he leans forward, droops his wings, and flashes his epaulets, I imagine shouldering the yellow center lines of the road. Near the recently thawed pond, within a long channel of construction, a man holding a sign. One side says slow, the other stop. Joy and sorrow always run like parallel lines. Inside the house, when I leave the lights on, small white moths come like a collection of worship, pulsing their wings up and up the window as if in a frenzied trance-like dance, some dervishes, 
others the penitent on shaky knees. The first few years after my husband's suicide, I wanted to be the penitent. I thought I deserved all the pain I could feel. The drill of the road work in that late summer was a welcome grinding music. Now, the yellow center lines are flung like braids behind me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dee Dee. So some of you are wondering, what's this Irish thing going on today? <laughs> so that came up with a, from a conversation we were having before this started. There's a, a, a bagel and burrito shop in Montpelier called Baguitos. They like hosting uh, musicians and writers. And every Saturday afternoon, almost every Saturday afternoon, all year long, there's a group of musicians who get together to play Irish music there. Uh, Hilary Farrington, who used to be the director of the Kellogg Hubbard Library, and Sarah Blair, who works at the library now, are two of the people who organize this. It attracts musicians from around the state of Vermont. And on a regular basis, they actually have musicians from Ireland who participate, who are visiting in Vermont and visiting you know, friends who are visiting. So it's, uh, it's really interesting to have. And I've seen some of you there. George dances there sometimes. <laughs> So we won't do that right now, though. We'll move on. <laughs> if I asked them, he would. But, so Karen McCadden is our fifth poet today. Karen is the author of Landscape with Plywood Silhouettes, winner of the Vermont Book Award and the New Issues Poetry Prize. She is the recipient of a National Endowment for the Arts Literature Fellowship, Literature Fellowship a Vermont Studio Center Fellowship, and the Sustainable Arts Foundation Writing Award. Her poems have appeared in the Best American Poetry, the Academy of American Poets Poem a Day series, Verse Daily, and in such journals as the American Poetry Review, Belo Beloit Poetry Journal, Horse Thief, Prairie Schooner, and Rattle. Karen is the Associate Director of the Conference on Poetry and Teaching at the Frost Place and teaches at Montpelier High School. Would you please welcome Karen McCadden. Hi, thanks for coming everybody. It's really hard to read last because um, I want to read every single poem I've ever written because each poem that everyone writes reminds you of something. Oh, I have a poem about birds and Ireland. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Is this loud enough? Okay. Um, I'll start tonight with, um, I'm going to read from my phone for the first time ever, um, maybe ever. There's a, a weekly journal that comes out as an email. It's called Love's Executive Order, and it's um, a weekly poem in defiance of the President of the United States. And so I have a poem that's coming out in that next week. And this is called, How I Know We Are Doomed. Terrible things happen, and we read about them. And then we do the next thing that changes nothing. The people at this AAU basketball tournament cheering their children on don't think they can do anything. They don't think anything. They don't think anything right now while the children play this game, or the next one. Most are just thinking, big D, big D, and yelling it, and yelling, box out, as if it were the end of the world if the children didn't box out. The boys do touch each other for good luck. Their hands speak the language of hope to each other. You will make the next one, is what that tiny slap says. Everyone in the gym believes it's true. When my son shoots hell, I uncross my legs and arms and fingers, damn if I'm not all in. Not one of us goes home and does anything to fix anything. No one can stop Big Baby. Big Baby is still going to do what Big Baby is going to do. I am going to go home and grade papers and read books, and tomorrow morning I will make the steel cut oats, the coffee. I will resist the alarm. I will put the trash out on trash day, check my calendar's list of small things I need to do, and I will do them. And go to bed and get up 
and do small things over and over, and they will never be big enough things. I can't do a big enough thing. I make a small path from my house to a basketball tournament, then back home where I light fires and sit with my dog. I answer emails, and for almost a year I read every article about Big Baby and yell in as loud and as well-composed posts as I can post on Facebook. Now, most of the time, I'm back to poems and dinner. I drive around and wonder if anyone in another car has a good enough idea to change anything about Big Baby or even the planet in its slow-mo crockpot. Sometimes I pray. Want to know what else? That first day, I stayed home and left my students with a substitute who got mad at them when they cried. I also did that. This is a time of year when many uh, parents are trying to decide where, they're sent, where to send their children next year. So this is a poem about sending my daughter away into the world, which um, reminds me of Dee Dee's poem about her son turning 20. And it has birds in it. So, yeah. It's called Passerines. I want to tell you about the thud against the back door that my man says bird that later we see its tail sticking out from underneath the siding, that its tail feathers shine like oil, sifting purple to blue, and we are kneeling on the wet decking, the yellow of its stomach making it something more than the brown birds everywhere, a tiny prize for kneeling there, for prying back the vinyl siding to find a yellow-bellied flycatcher, its cheek bloodied. I want to tell you how he held it, said passerine before it took flight. Little passerine, songbird. Before she left, I brought my daughter to saint Genet. There were swallows like boomerangs near dark, like here, like everywhere I go. I want to tell you about the neighbor, the scientist, who said they were swifts, not swallows. Swallows are passerines, but swifts are not. Passerine, I thought. Passerine, a more future verb tense for to pass, a tense I can't know yet, a passing I can't understand. The order passerine is a mess, the scientist said. It's impossible to track its evolution. I want to tell you I don't understand evolution, any of it, even mine, becoming the mother I will be next, the one who lets go. Once I stood on a bridge on a bridge, and a man taught me to call sparrows to eat from my hands, told me he was a sinner, that what he did for me was atonement, which is a thing I might understand. I want to tell you there is nothing like their tiny grip, the way they quiver while they peck at your palm, wanting to fly out of reach. I want to tell you what happened when I let her go, but I don't understand it yet. I want to talk about this morning, the little yellow bird in sudden dizzy flight, the trees full of yellow, how I lost sight. What to do next? This is a poem called Safety Instructions. My husband is right now in the sky flying, so I'll read this one for him. Fingers crossed for safety. Safety instructions. Unless directed by a crew member, do not construct if-then scenarios. Not about the plane, not about your life. Unless directed by a crew member, do not build flow charts for the past. Do not sweeten your silence or the beauty of the shoeshine man who only wanted your money. Do not consider Denver in the rain. Unless directed by a crew member, do not study the grid of the Western Plains. The forked and dissipating rivers do not translate. They should not call to mind the footprints of birds in the dust in your village. Unless directed by a crew member, again, do not study the Western Plains. Sometimes the fields are crop circles, but these hold no mystery. They are the elegant drawings only of rolling gantries. 
When resting, do not lean on the man next to you. Like the pilot, he will only ask you when you are making your, sorry, he will only talk to you when you are making your descent into Chicago. He will suddenly come alive, stop looking out the window, only to close the shade again quickly, will ask his flutter of questions, then disappear. Unless directed by a crew member, do not look at the reading material of the men flanking you. Do not show them the word they are searching for is backward and diagonal. Do not reach over and circle it. Unless directed by a crew member, do not dream, in general, of men or, in particular, of one. You are suspended above the world, a careening impossibility. You are flying headlong. As you fly east, the rivers are not isolated bird prints, are a pulse. The forests return, dispatches from the body. Unless directed by a crew member, do not calculate the weight of pronouns spoken by men. I'm going to read two more poems, one short, one a little beefy. Um, this is called When My Brother Dies, and then I, the last poem is um, about Ireland, but this one is not. <laughs> this is light work. Okay. When My Brother Dies. It happened already. It has happened five times and will happen again. My brother is dead. We try to recover what he stole and start by making a list we can't finish. I've been living up and down the same riverbank since I started having families. I stay on my side of the river, which makes our list full of half-truths. I will not cross the river. They try to cross his hands across his chest, but the hands keep falling. My brother's skin is older than my dead uncle's love for bees and sunlight. My uncle in the sunlight in his trailer saying, they want me to leave, but I love it here. Spending days in the hallway once fallen. My brother seems to love the satin sheets, his hands falling to touch them again. When I lean my hands on the fancy wood, I slip my brother a lollipop with a violet inside it. A sister is supposed to put something into the coffin to show love. So many nights we sat by the TV while he pawed a bowl of candy, nodding, nodding, and scratching at his face, his neck, as if plants had bitten him up. I don't know how to tell him what it means to live on a river. I don't know yet that he will die again. The ice lets go on the river and floats away like pool toys piloted by tiny children. Rivers fold into themselves, like oars into water, like little boys hurt too much. And I want to tell the tiny children, be careful. But there is no time to grow to love them as they braid downstream. I walk home uphill, past the comfrey and the massive oak. In the John boat, my brother and I float and row. Water weeds skim the boat. We eat quartered oranges and lean our backs against the gunnels and rip worms onto tiny hooks. We forget what is coming and act like there aren't any more deaths to come. We are lazy. The water moccasin coiled under the seat keeps its mouth shut as we climb out. Which death are my parents crying about now? I wonder if it's motorcycle death or locked in jail death. I hope it's shot by a gunman death and not wasted away death. Hypodermic needle death is the one I know it always is, though. It's a blue and translucent death this time. We cry like our eyes are needles, the plunger pressed. We cry like sugar water and dirty apartments. There he goes again. Here is another ice rink, another red-faced Ollie Ollie income free. I am telling on him again. He's dead again, and look what he did. Look how he won't wake up. Where does he keep going? He never packs a thing. The dog eats the linoleum, and his son shakes him to wake up. Little daddy, daddy, jabbing his father on the brown couch. We say, he won't wake up. It's a game? It's a game? His son asks. And we say no, or practice saying no. 
this brother whose first parents disappeared like ghosts, this father who keeps dying on couches and in vans knows how to do this one thing, this laying back of the head, this wooden blanket from the waist down, this wooden blanket, top door closing. I feel like I should stop, but I have one more, I have the Ireland poem. I'm gonna read the Ireland poem because how do I not read the Ireland poem? My whole second book is half about Ireland, so this is like a weird confluence here. Uh, this is called Caletter Forest, Father McLaughlin's Well, and all over Ireland and Donegal there are these holy wells that you go to and there'll be trinkets that people have left at them and people go pray and my cousin, um, we always have to go get holy water and I have to bring it home to Vermont. I, he makes me bring a bottle of it home along with some moonshine that he won't tell me where he gets. Caletter Forest, Father McLaughlin's Well. We cut through the forest to check the sheep on the far mountain and stop to fill our bottles. Sitka spruce make a grid filled with moss. Above the holy water, on the shelf, this shrine. Baby toys, wrappers of pills, prayer cards. Star Wars posters, Jesus, his beard chipped, pointing to his flaming heart. Next to him, another Jesus, broken ankles, alabaster, hollow, and full of leaves, a hole clear through his chest. Baby dolls, a cane, and face down there, Another Jesus slumped beside the shotgun shells, packs of cigarettes, snow globes. Near inhalers and Hello Kitty and zipped baggies of jewelry and charms, another Jesus, hands open. We kneel to bless ourselves. Midges worry the air until they find us. Nearby, in the asphodel, in the wet ditch, horse bones almost clean, look like what I think I am underneath. As Karen was saying, it must be awfully hard to decide which poems to read when you have so many. So the Irish theme was not planned. That just happened. But the, the Irish uh, poet, uh, Angela Patton, was born in Ireland, uh, raised in Dublin. And she was scheduled to read Yesterday at Pegidos. And that's rescheduled. She, she actually is going to be there on the 28th of this month to read Irish poetry while they have their weekly Irish traditional music session. So uh, I would like to again thank the Vermont College of Fine Arts for hosting us this afternoon. I would like to thank Orca Media for uh, taping this. And this will be on the uh, Orca website later on. Many of the Poem City events from this year and other years are on the ORCA website. And thank you, Rebecca, for dealing with our, our speaker problem in the beginning, or our, our audio problem. And thank all of you for being here, because uh, you know, we need to, not to just to have presenters, but we have to have audiences. And we really get wonderful audiences. And you have been a very wonderful audience. I want to especially thank our five poets, Megan, Diana, Major, Dee Dee, and Karen for being here today, for enriching our lives with your work, and for enriching our day with your presence. Thank you.